So, uh, so yeah, so we've had a, a great morning talking about uh, small holding and, and sustainable production at different scales and viabilities of production. Uh, this afternoon we're going to be talking about slightly larger sizes and uh, diversification. Uh, and so on that we've got uh, Michael and Tanya, uh, who have got a almost 50 acre site um, down near Glastonbury. Uh, where they're running educational projects as well. So we'll hear all about it. And then there's time for Q&A at the end, uh, and then we'll have a little break again. Over Hello, to you. Good afternoon. Hello, my name's Michael. I'm Tanya. We're from Paddington Farm. Um, does any, well, I can see a few faces I know in the audience. Um, anybody heard of Paddington Farm before? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, just to give you a brief outline, um, Paddington Farm is a charity, it's a trust, it's Paddington Farm Trust. It was set up 26 years ago um, with a, by, by a small group from London, an arts group called Paddington Arts, um, who used to come camping on the farm, you know, that who had, it was owned by a previous farmer. Called Alison Collier. Yeah, Alison Collier, who's kind of gone down in the annals of history of Glastonbury. Um, and they started off by coming camping on a regular basis over three or four years. And their dream was to have somewhere for urban children to, to come to on a regular basis to learn things about where their food come from, to have access to the countryside. And so by a series of uh, circumstances, they ended up taking over the farm and, and buying it at, at the time when the GLC was disbanding and there was quite a lot of funding floating about. Uh, so it was a kind of right time, right place sort of thing. Uh, so they ended up taking the farm over in about 86 and redeveloped with a group of volunteers, redeveloped a three-sided barn into residential accommodation. And um, that, that was the, the beginning of the journey of Paddington Farm Trust, which we celebrated the 25th anniversary last year and invited lots of people from the beginning, some of the first trustees and the first people who worked there, some people who come as children who now come with their own children. So there is a, a sense of continuity and that, that gathering last year to mark the 25th anniversary took place the week after the riots in London. So there was a real sense of people kind of remembering and realising the value that somewhere accessible in rural Britain has for young urban Londoners. Yeah, we're currently half, well, well, halfway through our summer season. Yeah. <laughs> we're quite exhausted, actually. We went to the wrong site on the way here. We went to the... Uh, but the sunrise. sunrise site <laughs> this morning. Because <laughs> I uh, got to the gate and thought, ah, oh, it might be at Fernhill Farm. <laughs> so we, we just scoot up and we just managed to make it just in time. So we're a bit sort of, uh, not jet lagged, but it feels a bit sort of strange. <laughs> yeah, so we're halfway through our summer season where it's, it's school holidays is when we mainly get our main kids from London and they, uh, they come down and we feed the animals with them and we uh, do activities like we've got. We have a forest school project in the woodland. We have a, uh, uh, a garden to help out in. They, they help us have vegetables and uh, and they they come and enjoy the freedom of the farm as well. It's quite open. We have this uh, device called Witchy's Hat, which, uh, where's Richard? Gone. <laughs> Richard's gone, but he helped us make the Witchy's Hat, which is this incredible ride, which the kids love. It sort of winds up, gets to the top, and it winds down really, really fast. And uh, the kids just scream, you know. And after work, what two days of being there, they're actually quite tired, and then we can actually do some serious work with them, you know. So, uh, as I say, we're happy to have our summer season at the moment, and we finish at the end of uh, end of this month. Uh, end of September. So, the concentration of the work that we do with the urban children is during the school holidays. Um, but as time's gone on, we've noticed that there are a lot more, say, home educating groups that come, a lot more parents who kind of gather together from urban areas and bring the kids away somewhere, which is slightly different because urban child, uh, school children have a different approach to learning. Even by the time they're six or seven, they are different to home educated children. So I'd say that school, um, from our observation, kind of inhibits your natural curiosity and your natural kind of quest to learn what interests you rather than learn what you're being given. So that, that's quite interesting as an observation and it means we slightly alter the things that we do to take that into account. Um, but for, as an, another example, we have um, groups of people, for example, who are homeless, who live in hostels in London, who've been hardcore drug and alcohol users, 
um, and who's sort of made it to a level of some kind of life maintenance and they're in the system, they have support within the system. Um, and they also get a completely different set of benefits from coming out to the countryside. Uh, a lot of them say that it's too far away from a shop <laughs> to actually be able to live in the country. But nevertheless, uh, they too just get an immense amount out of you know, seeing a distant horizon when you come from a kind of quite uh, compressed urban environment. To be able to see rolling hills and see the tour, go for a walk up the tour is quite challenging for a lot of urban people. Uh, of whom I am one, and I know exactly what it's like to feel scared of mud and brambles and falling over and that kind of thing. So it's really at the simplest level, a lot of what we're doing is just trying to get people to overcome fears and to explore areas of interest that come up for them that they don't get in their usual settings. So sitting on a fire, toasting marshmallows, going for a night walk, are all quite out the comfort zone, outside the comfort zone of your average... London child. Um, so that's a lot of the work that we do, I mean, and the chance to use axes and knives. Um, just as an example, the other day I did a, a whittling session with children, and for the first five or ten minutes, all they could talk about was how you're not supposed to use knives, and there's this man, and he had a knife in his car, and it didn't have a, a cover on, and, and they thought he was going to murder someone, you know. So they're being fed a lot of information which is very one-sided, and so it's a chance to get out an axe and a knife and something sharp and a slash hook and actually learn how to use them properly and give them that sense of responsibility about using tools as tools and not as toys and that they're not implements of murder and you know wounding and that kind of thing. So it's just opening up new avenues for them. Um, and again with gardening, just digging up potatoes is the most exciting thing in the world if you've never done it before. And being able to use spades and diggers and forks. And, and then you get into mud and you see what mud's actually doing. You can look at worms and bugs and things that you find in the garden other than vegetables. Um, so as an organic farm, it tends to be quite an organic experience. Um, and perhaps one of the challenges we have, wouldn't you say, is lack of time, lack of uh, consistent hands. Um, so we do a lot of work with volunteers. Uh, we, we have regular woofers, people who come and volunteer from town. We have a Wednesday is our volunteer day. So then anybody can come, um, young or old, whether you've had spent too long on the computer or you're socially isolated, you need to get out and meet other people. Um, people who feel they're unfit and they come to the what we call the green gym to uh, just get back in touch with their muscles again. Um, and so, in terms of what the farm, do you want to talk about what the farm, what we've got on our 43 acres? Well, clearly, the animals and things. Animals, pasture. Right. Well, uh, when we first arrived at the farm, there was two goats, Guernsey goats, quite beautiful goats, but they're both male and they both had snip, so they were a bit useless. We had uh, 14 ex battery chickens, which uh, <laughs> we've still got three of them left, haven't we? Mm -hmm. So that's three left in four years, that's right. Mm -hmm. We have a uh, because we haven't got very much funding, we have to wait for gifts to arrive, and we got gifted a whole herd of boa goats last year. I don't know whether anybody has, has, is familiar with boa goats. They're small South African goats. They're, they're meat goats. They're uh, very inquisitive. They'll get out of anywhere you put them into. <laughs> they'll, uh, they're, quite, they're, they're quite inquisitive. Very, lots of personality. We have an Elga, uh, a male goat called Elga who's got too much personality, to be honest. <laughs> But he's, he's, done, he's done us really well, and we've had uh, five kids this year, haven't we? Mm -hmm. And uh, so we've got uh, quite a nice developing, uh, quite a nice developing flock of goats there, a herd of goats. We've also bottle fed, bottle fed three sheep when we first arrived on the farm, didn't we? About four years ago, and those three gave birth, and then they gave birth again, and now their kids have given birth. So we've now got twelve sheep, which is uh, quite nice going. Mm -hmm. We lost our best sheep last year; got stuck in an electric fence. So it was a real shame. I was reading in, in, a, in an article in The Landsman, sort of saying it's, it's, a, it's always a surprise how you always lose your best animals. So it's a, so I don't feel so bad now after hearing that. <laughs> We've uh, been hatching new chicks. Kids love the chicks as well. They, uh, they just adore them. You know, we, we've got one chick at the moment who the kids have got really friendly with, and it's almost like a, a pet bird now. Sits on the shoulders, sits on the head. And, and you know, it's just really nice that they can interact on that level because it means so much more to relate 
food to animals, if you know what I mean, because when you go to the supermarket all the time and just see the chicken from packets, you know, you don't actually see the living, breathing creature. I think that's what we show on the farm as well. Mm. There's one or two children that have gone vegetarian, actually, <laughs> since they've met the baby animals. <laughs> um, so we've got, you could say that at the moment we're probably a, a small, uh, like a small holding. Um, there's a lot of potential to grow because, as Michael said, there were very few animals when we arrived. We, we incidentally, are the farm managers, so we're employees of the trust. And the trust um, has a board of trustees, 12 trustees, who are based mainly in London, um, which, you know, is something we'd like to address over time is to find perhaps one or two trustees from Somerset um, that might lend more of a rural um, insight into the, what the trustees think about. Because they can sometimes be a bit isolated from the day-to-day -day life of rural living and farm life. Um, they tend to be more people who are sort of social entrepreneurs. Um, they're part of this sort of, you know, they work for children's charities and law society, that kind of thing. Um, so sometimes we have little areas of, uh, where we have to work things out because they don't always see things from our perspective. Um, and they get focused because they come, often work in big charities. They deal with huge funding packages of millions and we sort of struggle along trying to get £1,000 here and £500 there. Uh, funding's been, I find it's a big problem for us, that funding is not only disappearing, um, but the funding that you do go for is, uh, there's always a shortfall of funding for the amount of people that are uh, applying. So effectively, farms, uh, sorry, charities are competing with each other these days. And if you don't have a department full of fundraisers, then it's a very uh, hand-to-mouth existence. So over the last three years, with the help of the Board of Trustees, we've become a social enterprise, which gives us a bit more scope to look at diversifying in, and try to bring in new incomes, which we can then spend on the infrastructure of the farm. Because for funding, of course, you get funding for a playground or a play, piece of play equipment or funding for a garden, but that doesn't pay for the fences and it doesn't pay for the, you know, the wear and tear of mattresses and bedding and how to maintain your residential accommodation. So it will, in the long term, as we bring in more incomes, it will allow us a bit more freedom to spend the money where we want to. Um, so that's what we've been doing over the last couple of years, is looking at diversifying. We lost a large chunk of fixed income, which was coming through Westminster Council, because a lot, a lot of the groups of children that come down come from Westminster Borough. Um, so that funding was cut uh, about two years ago. So we took the 25th anniversary as our sort of starting point to start looking at new ways of um, bringing in even triple incomes. So for us, camping was the obvious one uh, because it means it's the same people, it's, it's just about tents and we've actually hired some yurts uh, for the last two years from a local yurt maker, uh, Avalon Yurts product placement. Um, and that went really well, well last year as our sort of 25th birthday special thing to do. And so we thought we'd try it this year because um, there was no Glastonbury. So the yurts were sort of more available to us. So this year we've been doing yurt camping from April <laughs> as an experiment. Discovered, I think, along the way that a, April's a bit cold um, and we've had the worst summer since anyone can remember. So that's been a bit limiting as well, but nevertheless, it's, it's working out okay. Um, and it turns out that the income from tents is probably gonna save our bacon this year. The income from people who just wanna camp somewhere, laid back without a kind of pitch all pegged out for you, um, and with loads to do for children, that has actually been our most sort of popular take up this year. So that's quite interesting. Um, we're hoping to break even on the yurts, um, if we're lucky. Uh, but it's all swings and roundabouts. Um, we've also got a horticultural uh, project, which we have as a partnership with the farm, uh, called Torganics. And they're growing organic fruit and vegetables for the local area. Um, and they've just this year taken on the organic market stall on our ch Tuesday market in Glastonbury. So that's given them a more, more of an opportunity to do direct selling. Um, we also run, do you want to talk about Bridies? Um, yeah, we, 
we came to Glastonbury about seven years ago to look after a friend's organic whole food shop in Glastonbury called Brad Jard, I don't know whether you've heard it. And uh, he, was going, he was getting a bit tired, so we said, go away for six months and have a holiday and we'll look after it for you. After nine months, he hadn't come back. After 12 months, he came back and said, listen, do you want to run it for a while while I just continue my holiday? So to two years later, we were still there, and, and as we ultimately took, took over the running of the, uh, of the, the co-op, it sort of supplies, we only do organic things in the, the co-op, from organic whole foods to fruit and veg, uh, to superfoods, we've, we've got a nice range of superfoods. Uh, it's not a very big place, we regularly get about 70 customers though through the door. We only open two days a week, Thursday evenings and Friday during the, the day. So we have two days open, we're averaging about, what, 1,500, 1,500 pounds in those two days, so it's actually really worth, worthwhile to do. Uh, and so that's been running for 12 years, because Simon bought it off someone else who was running before him. So it's an ongoing uh, project as well. And uh, it's also got a community space attached to it as well, where we host events, parties, uh, conferences, uh, memorial services. You know, it's got a, a, a loads of uses, doesn't it? Mm. The most popular thing last year was the Dub Cafe, which we run down there on a Sunday, which where the parents came down with the kids, and they uh, had a really good day because the kids could play. and with, with uh, reggae music, which was a really nice atmospheric thing. Mm. And, uh, and it's nice to have, um, while we were at Brides, we thought, wouldn't it be nice to have somewhere you could actually be growing the food to be putting in the shop at Brides? And then uh, three years ago, we met the manager at Paddington Farm, and she said, you should apply for my job, because I'm leaving. And we said, no, 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 we don't want another job. We're doing Brides Yard. It's enough for anybody. And, uh, and so we, uh, we hesitated a while, but then a friend says, you know, you've been talking about it for a while, but you just apply for the job. On a, on, on a certain level, <laughs> you know, we, we got the job, you know. Yeah. And it's been sort of constant hard work ever since. I mean, we couldn't believe how much hard work it's taken us just to get it to this level where it's almost, almost self-sustaining. We reckon by the end of this year, we'll be a lot closer to it being sort of self-funding, which is where we want to get to, so we can get out of the grant, grant scene completely and just, you know, and, and generate the income ourselves. And, we, and this year we've, I don't know whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, but we've had five weddings on the farm. And uh, we thought that might be a, a direction to go in, but weddings are quite special days for people. And uh, they made lots of demands, which we didn't expect. And they, they like loud music, and we have neighbours, and we really upset one of the local neighbours. We, uh, we protected some neighbours with straw bales in the actual uh, tent. We had one wall of straw bales. But that just pushed the sand onto the next neighbour's field, which was a camping field. And at uh, 8 o'clock in the evening, they were knocking on my door saying, what, what, what's happening? And I thought, oh my God, they said they could, they could play till 12. So we had to do a bit of wheeling dealing. It was a complete shock. And so we think next year we're going to not do any weddings. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a trial and error experience on the farm as well. Because the, there's no sort of a manual of how to, to do these sorts of things. So it's all about, oh, hiya. <laughs> He knows more about Brides than we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, so we, we, we're we exploring weddings this year um, as a use of the space and a way of generating income and working with local young families uh, or people who are going to have young families. And to a certain extent, it's, you know, it's been an interesting experiment, but I think perhaps in, when we get the benefit of hindsight at the end of the summer, um, it will be something that we think is probably a bit too far away from our core work, which is working with kids, and is, you know, it has a workload attached to it, which is additional to everything else that we're trying to do. So, so we kind of might get one or two acoustic type weddings next year, but I think we put that putting that one to one side, and then what we're exploring for this year is the, the coming year is perhaps to look at courses. Um, so to try and, because we have residential accommodation, to try and use that, which will be, it will be something that we wouldn't have to pay out for, um, to invite course leaders to come and teach things like rural crafts, um, aspects of agriculture, um, all kinds of things. And you know, really in this context, looking at the new technology that will be appropriate for farming in the future and for small scale farming, because that is going to be relevant to a lot of us, probably. <laughs> so um, that's our next sort of phase that we're thinking is a lot quieter. It means that we can invite course leaders in um, 
with skills that we need to learn, such as hedge laying or willow weaving, things that are going to be relevant to us. It's very difficult for us to take a week off to go and learn something. So it's best to bring it to, into the, the mix. Um, and then look at if we can put, start providing some you know, reasonably accessible, you know, lower cost courses than see what seems to be out there. Because a lot of, I think of, when you're looking through the sort of magazines, the eco mags, you might say, I still think a lot of the courses are out of a lot of people's pockets, you know, this well out of people's range. And so there's a certain fadding going on with the introduction to small holdings and the introduction to pig keeping and stuff like that. I mean, we joke about putting on a course of, you know, how to kill your, um, your ideal of living on the land and get people up at four o'clock in the morning and let the pigs out and do all the things that we actually find a part of the day-to-day -day thing. We used to make lists a long time ago when we first started and we've discovered that they're a complete waste of time because usually, even before you've opened your eyes in the morning sometimes, the list's out the window because the goats have got onto the neighbour's apple trees and, you know, the day begins with that and then it, you just follow it around seeing what it's going to do next. So, yeah, organic farming is organic. There is no planning to it. I think if you're doing it on a commercial scale, um, you adjust the commercial, you know, the non-organic commercial things and you shift them over. At our level, with just, you know, 11 sheep and 9 goats and half a dozen chickens, we sometimes fall below the standard requirements because we're having to do it, we haven't got money to throw at things. So just recently, for example, we fell, fell foul of the Soil Association with goats because while they, while they were pregnant, we were feeding the, the does non-organic goat food once a day because we can't get organic goat food in our area without buying a ton. And so we don't have the storage space or the finances to keep a ton of goat food for a year. That's one example. Or, you know, we, we had two ewes and the neighbour offered up his ram but it meant putting our use in with his flock, um, which means we've lost our organic status in our lambs this year because they went next door, which was the most convenient thing for us, the most convenient thing for the farm next door. It didn't involve any petrol costs or anything like that, but they were on a non-organic farm for six weeks, even though we know that the farmer practices organic farming, but he's not registered. So stuff like that uh, can be frustrating at times. Um, but we are also learning as we go along, and we're neither of us from a farming background. I think we got the job because we're from, more from a community background, and the trustees were aware that uh, the farm had got into a little bit of a pocket of just dealing with people from London, and there, was no, there were no relationships with the town itself and the local area. So that's a lot of the other aspect of what we've been doing, is working with the local community, building up the possibility of providing food, um, activities for children, you know, opportunities for people to come and use the land in different ways. Um, so in all of that great big muddle of stuff, <laughs> we managed to keep going, don't know how we're doing it. Uh, it's quite tiring. We are nurturing a loose group of people that we would call friends of the farm, who value it being there, who want to see it succeed and people who offer skills and time and energy and ideas and knowledge that we don't have. Um, so as farm managers, I think part of what we do is to just encourage as many people who are interested in the land and growing and farming and children and changing ideas uh, to come and visit. You know, please feel free to come and visit and contact us. The flies are there. Um, the types of things we're talking about are people who have skills that they would like to share as part of the course, um, people who have skills in media, because otherwise today we would be doing a presentation with lots of lovely pictures of children toasting marshmallows and building dens, and it's all on a hard drive somewhere, and we gather those photos and bits of film, but so far we haven't managed to produce anything with them. Um, People who just like a bit of hard graft and don't mind any kind of job that they're offered. Um, people who don't, you know, want to change everything in the first five minutes but are prepared to go along with your own 
way of exploring and experimenting with things. Um, so yeah, uh, but people who want to come and camp and bring your children and have a good time. Um, you have a bit of freedom. So I think that's, that's where we benefit the most is by building this network of friendships um, of people who can see the value of a non-commercial educational and recreational space. Um, so we invite you to come and, if you're passing through Glastonbury or you live locally, come up and see us. Anything you want to say to finish? Uh, well, what I, the working on the farm, what I find quite remarkable is the idea that a lot of the kids who come to the farm are, are natural farmers. They come from London, they've never seen a, uh, they've never seen goats before, never handled a goat, but they're actually, they've got the skills and the actual uh, abilities to actually be farmers without even being taught it. And it's a real, I feel like it's an instinctive thing within us as people to be managing land and to be, uh, and to be, I mean, how many people dream of having a bit of land to, so they can have animals and stuff? It's part of our hard wiredness. And, uh, and I think it's something which, once you get an opportunity to explore it, it actually comes quite natural to people. And I think it's, uh, what I've benefited from the farm is uh, uh, the ability to be in the moment a lot of the time, because as Tony says, planning is, is actually useless. But you can have longer term plans and you know the general direction, but on a day to day basis, you know, sort of say, I'm going to look out the pigs tomorrow, I'm doing that, because it doesn't work like that. And uh, so, you know, please come down and visit Penny and Farm and come get your hands dirty because it's a, it's a great experience, it's a beautiful place. We've got orchards, we've got woodland, we've got, uh, we've got uh, uh, animals to, to, to look after and to nurture and stuff. So please, please come down and, and join me. Um, I just want to see if anybody wanted to ask any questions quickly. Mm. That's always me. Um, yeah, the organic says you said you've lost it from the Soil Association. Is that what's more important? I, I know people who've been, you know, or had organic status and, and give it up. Is to me, it's not about organic status; it's about a trust relationship with the customers and. People, people seem to, seem to think they need to have organic sets or whatever. Is that I know lots of people who are farming organically, in terms of doing all the things an organic farmer would do, but they've never ever applied for it because it's pointless and bloody expensive. Excuse my French. Yeah, there's there's certainly that aspect, and I know that there, I mean we've met, we've got friends who've all come out of the status. We um, on those two cases we didn't actually lose. We only lost the status on the kids and the lambs. And so, you know, if we get it right next year, they'll get their status back. I think from the trust's point of view, um, the, organic, the organic status is worth maintaining because it's part of the education process. And our experience um, as novice farmers, or beginners, you might say, is that you can see very quickly how easy it is to bend the rules. It is so easy. And the reason that soil association have such strict standards is to curb, you know, is to inhibit that. And I think if you look at commercial farming, industrial scale farming, the way that people have been farming, in the, say for the last, since the war, since the introduction of mechanisation, petrol based farming and mass consumerism, is that people will go to extremes to bend the rules. And I'll give you one small example which really made me think was we were um, having piglets one year and I was standing there talking to this lady about pigs and raising pigs and stuff and I was saying, oh, you know, she said, oh, you can just give them swill, can't you? Just any stuff, from, they'll, they'll eat anything. That's people's perception is pigs will eat anything. And I said, no, well, actually, the law is that you cannot feed uh, pigs anything that been out of, has been in a domestic or catering kitchen which rules out your house and anything that's left on the plate and even getting stuff from the farmer's market, you know, the leftovers, it's questionable. And she said, oh, she said, that's funny, because uh, when I worked at a hospital, we used to send all the medical waste to the pig farm. And so that just made me stop and think, and think right, okay, so there is right reason behind this. You know, the pendulum has just swung back the other way. And I think we're in a process with modern food production that someone has got to take notice of how it, how it is done in, at its worst level and how it can be done at its best. And so I think that process, whoever's part of that process, 
whether or not they have status, is we're going into that transition back to natural food. And we've been through a, well, we're still in a process of abuse of food. So I think that the role that the um, Soil Association, as an example of one of those bodies, takes is trying to get that standard back up to where it's, it's part of natural farming. And it's, it's very difficult for people who can't afford the status, even though they're doing it. And you're absolutely right, it is all about the relationship that you have with whoever's buying your food. With those restaurants, those customers at the stall, the people who bother to come up to the farm and buy some pork when it's there. It's all about that. And the more that people can see the food that they're eating before it's been harvested, the more they understand uh, why, you know, why the, what the difference is. So quite a lot of what we do is try and get kids to pick up, you know, dig up some potatoes, find some eggs, and just go and have egg and chips. You know, if that's because some of them, they, they wouldn't entertain eating spinach or chard or anything like that. So it's, it really gets down to that sort of simple fact, but trying to get people to taste the difference. And they see, you know, they, they can taste it straight away. They can see the difference in the food. So I think it's, it is an unfortunate situation, but I'm kind of, I understand a lot more now um, why it's like that. Because I... weird isn't it you need you need a license to not spray chemicals mm. it shouldn't really be the other way around yeah yeah um so i'm going to try and not run over as much as i did this morning because i got my times very wrong this morning sorry everyone this morning that, that impacted um so anyone got one more burning question they want to ask there will be more q a at the end of this afternoon session i was just going to say have you thought about processing the food uh, in terms of your camping so that you can maybe be selling ready meals and also the other thing about the ticket prices where you can you can have uh, a certain price and for any profit that could subsidise other people that cannot afford to do it and obviously concession tickets as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, in terms of the processing, again, it's about finding somebody with the time and the skills to do that. We've got a couple of local people who sort of pop through and pick up the veggies that haven't sold that week and turn it into pickle and you know that kind of thing so that goes on the shop shelf that's the beginning uh, we've started a honey well a bee project which at the moment is to support the bees and pollination but hopefully one day we'll have some honey um, in terms of subsidizing that's definitely a direction that we're heading in um, you know middle class loving parents also like to bring their children to the farm and there's no exclusion to anybody who wants to come uh, but we do put that extra effort into getting the urban kids out. And with, with this transition from there being this sort of standardised grant system of the past, which no longer exists, um, those groups themselves are finding it difficult to get funding. So we're recognising that if we want them to come, we're going to have to find a way to make it so cheap and easy. And so we're in that process at the moment of um, supporting the groups that we have a long association with uh, to come in a more flexible way um, and also to look at how we could perhaps spend some time in the winter doing courses for, like for example, somebody phoned up about doing graduate training uh, when, I, when we were on our sort of downtime from kids and perhaps charging a bit more for that which would then, you know, and actively saying this will go towards supporting a camping group to come from, you know, wherever. Um, so it's definitely the way we're thinking. I think because we're only poor, four part-time staff, Michael and I are a job share, so, uh, but part-time farming is actually impossible. So we end up, you know, you just do it. You do what needs to be done. But it means that we don't have the extra people who might improve the publicity or, you know, to help us um, manage that process. So it is a bit organic. <laughs> And a lot of it, again, goes back to relationships and, and getting to know people. That, again, covers a lot of the publicity as well, actually, because word of mouth, people who've really enjoyed the experience do go and tell other people. So. In fact, we had a bloke who came to us this summer who actually came to the talk we gave two years ago here, <laughs> and he eventually made it down to the farm. So yeah. please come down. 
yeah. soon. <laughs> you must have amazing testimonials from kids as well. They must love it. Yeah, we were doing an evaluation form at the end of the, the week they spent with us, and they fill it all in. And it's really magical reading about you know their discoveries oh, and uh, and what they've learned and uh, the things they don't like and the things that they really enjoyed. Mm. So it's, yeah. It's if you could make a farm bug and spider free, they'd all be happy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you.